Welcome to Freight Waves Now. I'm your host, Sydney Edwards, joined by the one and only Anthony Smith this morning. That's right. And on this Thursday morning, we have a lot of big news to get to. And among other things, we have our On the Spot segment in the next hour, which is going to have Tony Mulvey, and we look at some of the weirder stories in enterprise trucking with Thomas Watson. But first, we have to get to our top story, which includes the House passing a bill and the possibility, ending the possibility of a rail strike. And now we open it up to our panel of experts with our very own Mike Bondistel here with us and, of course, Rachel Premack. Thank you all so much for being here. Good to see you in person. <laughs> it's been a back. minute, too. <laughs> it has been a while. I know we all got together in F3, but this really calls for all in-person visits, if possible, and I'm excited to jump into this one. And, Mike, I'll kick it off to you first real quick. This is big news. A lot of people are saying that we're going to avert this. This wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now that we see what was come to, what's next and what are the outcomes from here? Yeah, so we've been talking about this for a number of months. And, and sort of my really thought process that whole time was, well, if there is a strike, it's only going to last a matter of hours before they order everyone back to work. Now it looks like we can avoid a strike entirely. House passes that um, that resolution, that, that, that bill. Um, you know, there was sort of two segments of it. One was just ordering the workers back to work. The other was, you know, included the paid sick leave, which um, those workers might actually get that that sick leave. Um, you know, we'll see what happens in the Senate. So now the Senate is going to vote on both of those things separately, and we'll see what happens. And most of the um, you know, Republicans are against the, the the added sick leave. Either not so much that they're against workers taking time off; it's more that they don't want um, you know, the government to interfere with the private negotiations. But you know, I don't think we're going to have a strike. I'm not sure whether those guys are going to get the additional seven days of, of sick leave that they're, that they're looking for. Now, Mike just broke it down a bit of what we're seeing with this new bill, but we also have Rachel Premack here with us to maybe dive a little bit deeper into what just happened with this bill. Yeah, so what we're seeing right now is that the House uh, voted yesterday to approve to uh, intervene, avert the rail strike, and force rail laborers to adopt the tentative agreement that was brokered by the White House in September. Uh, they also passed, by a somewhat slim, uh, slim margin, they also passed the uh, guarantee for rail workers to have seven days of paid sick leave. And today we'll see the Senate vote and debate on that. Uh, we saw several senators from both the left and the right say that they really want to provide that sick leave to workers, and we'll we'll see if they'll be able to come to agreement on that on that uh, sick leave. And Rachel, as you mentioned, we go to the Senate now. Do we see anyone breaking ranks here, either from the Senate or from the Democratic side? Yeah. So uh, you know, Biden and Schumer, obviously both uh, on the Democratic side, they both said, you know, we're going to just go ahead with uh, intervening and ending the strike. They didn't really say anything along the lines of, oh, and we need this sick leave. Uh, really, just the, what they were putting forth was, we are ending the strike. Sick leave can be uh, negotiated for in another forum. Uh, so it, it, it is somewhat breaking rank for uh, Senator Sanders and uh, Kristen Gillibrand, who's also co-sponsoring uh, legislation to to amend and add on the seven-day sick leave. Um, on the Republican side, we do see several senators who are also pushing for the sick leave. That includes uh, Senators Ted Cruz and uh, Marco Rubio. They both came out and saying, you know, we are pushing for the sick leave. We want the sick leave. Um, but whether they're just going to tweet that and post that on Twitter versus whether they're actually going to vote uh, in that way is, is another story, because we've seen another Republican senator also say, yeah, I'm going to vote for the sick leave, and then the next day say, eh, actually, I'm not so sure. It seems we're, we're all here maybe just wondering if they're going to put that sick leave in, what's going to be said about that, especially when that's one of the main points that these rail unions are trying to make and one of the main issues that they're trying to get ahead. Mike, I'll ask you, where do you think this might go when it comes to the sick leave, your own opinion? 
Well, I think it could go either way. I think they could either just pass it because they they have the votes to order the workers to stay on the job, um, and I and I also think you know they could include those sick leaves just because everyone um, you know wants to be in favor of of workers' rights. The Democrats want to regain some credibility with union households and, and and working households, and no one wants to stand up in Congress and saying I am against workers taking time off. For, for, for sick time, and most people don't have the context that is that over the years, the unions have given up some of that sick time in exchange for the higher pay scale, and the pay scale is a lot higher than most um, industrial work, and, and most people don't have that context and just see this as, this is ridiculous, they don't, have, they don't have sick time. Like, with the House passing this now, um, is there any room now for further negotiations to change things up or reach a deal before this is all finalized? There could be. I mean, there's probably, there are probably negotiations now. I mean, there's also the possibility that instead of passing, you know, a law to order, you know, the workers on, to stay on the job, that they just, you know, request that they take another month or two to um, continue negotiations, sort of an extending off of that cooling off period. They could also submit it to binding arbitration. I mean, those both of those are, are possibilities. I think it's less likely, um, you know, given that the, we're past the midterm elections and the House went to the Republicans, I think the, they probably just want to get something done right now. So I think the, the likelihood is Senate passes something either with or without sick leave. We get it signed into law in the next few days. Now, Rachel's been shaking her head on the other side. I'm, I'm assuming agreeing with Mike here on what she sees happening as well. Rachel, yesterday you mentioned a wildcat strike in your article. Tell me a little bit more about that and if you see that that's a possibility here. Yeah, so what happens in the case that the House and the Senate and uh, President Biden signs in this legislation saying, you know, you have to take on this contract, this is it, you're back to work, uh, the rail workers could still choose to go on an illegal strike or a wildcat strike, which means that they don't go to work and they are striking and protesting and probably all around that uh, paid sick leave. Um, and that they could do that, and they may do that just to, you know, really push the issue and show their frustration with how uh, things have been going on, on uh, the rail side for, for this past few years. Um, but if that happens, the railroad companies could go to a federal judge and get an injunction to have the railroad workers go back to work. And we saw this, uh, you know, a few decades ago with the air traffic controller strike uh, in 1981 under, under President Reagan. Uh, they did go on a wildcat strike, or about 11,000 of them did go on a wildcat strike, and it did not go well for them. It ultimately resulted in all of them losing their jobs. Some people uh, received legal repercussions. Um, on the other hand, whether Biden would want to go through with this or oversee something like this would be um, really going back on his promise of being the most pro-labor president in history. That's really something that he was running on. So it, it would be quite a interesting uh, turning away from his from his previous promises if his administration saw something, uh, you know, like forcing these railroad workers back to work if they were to pursue a wildcat strike. And Rachel, with this now passing, um, does this take away from negotiations or anything that the rail unions will look to do in the future negotiations? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we could see um, perhaps these railroad companies be a little bit more, perhaps more amenable to to their demands. We could see the railroad companies instead say, you know, we're going to just go forward and do what we want. The kind of the the tension right now is that America, the American public generally is more pro labor than they have been in decades. According to one Gallup poll, they are more pro-union pro that they have been since uh, 1965. So we're seeing an American public that really would support rail workers in their struggle for uh, better pay or better, uh, better treatment and better uh, sick leave benefits. Um, so whether or not, you know, these workers would have the support of the American public five five years, 10 years from now, uh, that's not quite as certain. So it is a really 
um, opportune time for these workers to be, uh, you know, protesting and uh, potentially discussing a strike. Thank you, Rachel. Now, Mike, if this bill passes, who wins? What happens next? Well, I think it's a win if we can avoid a strike and we can stop talking about it all the time on freight waves now and move on to other things. That would be that would be nice. Um, I, I think it would be you know obviously a huge win for the the workers if they actually got those seven you know extra days of, of sick leave. I think you know as far as your question uh, to Rachel just a minute ago about you know upcoming negotiations and in, in, in the future, I think a lot of that might you know depend on uh, whether these workers that have been recently hired and recently trained and are going through training now actually stick around. Um, you know, the, the railroads have had a hard time with uh, retaining the, the, the workers or getting those workers back to work that they, you know, temporarily let go when volumes fell off in, in, in 2020. Usually they have an easy time doing that. They didn't have an easy time doing that this time. So they've, they've made all made really big efforts to train, you know, a huge number of employees. It's like a four to six month training program, and we'll see how many of them actually stick around when things really get tough, like you know being outside in January in Chicago all day and all night. So um, we'll see about those things. I mean, so so we'll see if there's you know enough workers that are that are interested, and, and that could have an impact on future negotiations. And Mike, that labor part, of course, is what this is all about. Do you see this really kind of being more motivation for really kind of having more tech and more? automation really entered the industry? Yeah, that's a whole separate issue. And that's part of the why, um, you know, the, the morale is low among the, um, the smart TD, which represents the, the conductors, because the railroads want to go from a two-man crew, so having two guys on a train consist to just one. So you would just have the locomotive engineer and you'd have the conductor simply doing, uh, law, strictly doing law, uh, yard work. And so that's been, um, you know, a big issue. That's not in this ne negotiation specifically, but that's something that I could see coming down the pipeline because, you know, you have had all these advancements in safety technology that really makes a two-man crew not necessary. We have Rachel Premack with us and Mike Bowden Distel. Rachel, tell us where folks can hear more from you moving forward. Um, I have a weekly newsletter, Modes. It's available at FreightWaves.com slash Modes, or you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn if that's, if that's your thing. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us this morning, Rachel. And Mike, where can folks hear more from you? So I do, do a newsletter also, largely on CPG as well as Rails and as any other topics I find interesting in Sonar. You can get that at uh, www.FreightWaves.com forward slash the stock app. Thank you all for tuning in and joining us right now. Keep up with us because right now we're going over to the wall for our first carrot update of the morning. Welcome into this carrier update. Donnie, going to start out here looking at the NTI, looking at the NTI forecast. And that's. Yeah, so I haven't brought the forecast up before, but it's, it's getting time. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to bring it up before Thanksgiving and hurt some people's feelings, but we're going to ruin people's Christmases now. So in the yellow here, I have the NTI. This is the seven day rolling average. In the dotted blue, this is the forecast. And of course, forecasts aren't 100%, but we're, in a, we're within a few cents. And you can see the direction lines up really well. So when you look at this forecast, think of it, think about things like the direction that it's heading and other than just the exact number. Yep. But here we, here we are today, 259. And I think the actual was what, 267? 267, yeah, we'll it was a big bump, but yeah. it was, you have to remember, yesterday is the last day of the month, you see that increase. Yeah, and I have it pulled up here next year, but we see that the uh, forecasted just takes a nosedive. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is this 236. Yep. So here we're, we're gonna come down um, basically 20 cents. Yep. Uh, now, there's nothing, there's no volatility in the market, there's nothing, there's nothing adhesive to hold anything together right now for carriers. Yep. We're past the first big bump of Thanksgiving. We're now waiting on that new Christmas bump, which as we talked about that 15th of the month, now we see this here, the forecast starting to move back up. 
bottom. Mm -hmm. So I would expect this to start moving back up. So over the next week or so, I would take this downhill in spot rates very seriously. That's yep. what we're going to probably see. Yep. Uh, now, of course, on the NTID, it's going to be up and down, but you're going to see that it's probably trending down. And so it'll be important to look at this NTI. And then we're going to start to probably see it move back up just a little bit. Yep, absolutely. Contracted rates are going to follow the same pattern at a little bit of a lag. So let's pop over here and look at the next chart just to kind of see. Uh, this is our NTID for today. Yeah, we're up at 267. Yep. But the national average, the, the seven day rolling average is at 259. It's moving, trending back up here because of two things. One, Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and the end of the month. Now, we had a pretty dip here in the middle of the month. We actually finished the end of October and the end of November finished about the exact same. Yep. But you pointed out here, we didn't see that much of a big of a peak before Thanksgiving. We would have expected this to be a little bit higher. Yeah, I guess my whole thing earlier when we were talking off air was I would have thought Thanksgiving would have been the peak and maybe we maintain it through the end of the month. And really it was, there was a little peak, but it, it fell back pretty quickly. And then you got the big peak here at the end of the month, right? I mean, we went from 259 to 267 overnight. Well, at Thanksgiving, we peaked out at 265. So I think that was what was interesting to me, not that we are exactly where we were back in October. That doesn't surprise me. I guess it was more of the timing yeah. of when this peaked. And this happened. could be partly because of we had the earliest Thanksgiving possible since yep. today is Thursday again, yep. and it's the first day of the month. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if it was the 31st today, that would be you know the last day, the last Thursday. It would be Thanksgiving. But we had the Thanksgiving one of the 24th, mm -hmm. so we had almost a full a full week. So here we got through that deliveries of Monday, and then we still had Tuesday and Wednesday to to let things kind of slow down a little bit. Yep. So. Uh, so it can happen, but we saw it jump back up here still. So interesting things going on as we, as I talked about yesterday. The peaks are a lot narrower. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't start out earlier because there's no volatility involved with the carriers. It's, it's, it's shipper controlled. The drivers get a few days to bump their rates up and then it's over. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll toss it over to Sydney Edwards with a look at this morning's top stories. Getting into these headlines this morning, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, Carl Bradley Johansson, owner of a pair of California-based trucking companies, has been sentenced to 10 years in jail for several federal crimes, including one that resulted in a truck explosion that killed a welder. Now, Johansson pleaded guilty in September 2021 to two counts involving the tanker truck explosion, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California. It also marks the second time he has been convicted of a crime that involved the death of a welder working on one of his company's trucks. Additionally, he pleaded guilty to one count of tax evasion, one count of conspiracy to commit bank fraud, and one count of bank fraud. The bank fraud charges are a result of what the U.S. attorney called a scam involving the Paycheck Protection Program, which funneled funds to thousands of trucking companies with the requirement that a certain percentage of those funds be spent to keep employees working. Instead, prosecutors say he fired employees and spent the funds elsewhere. Johansson was sentenced on Tuesday. In FedEx Freight, the nation's largest lessened truckload carrier will begin furloughing an undetermined number of drivers on Sunday. Yesterday, FedEx said the voluntary furloughs will run until March 6, with drivers getting a guarantee to return to work. FedEx Freight is offering drivers a $300 weekly incentive to accept a furlough. The total payments will be made when the drivers return to work. The number of furloughs to be allowed per service center will be disclosed internally through this week. And FedEx Freight said it will not publicly release any details about the furlough totals or the centers where they will be requested. The unit has said previously that not all service centers would be asked to furlough drivers. And the volume of sales of U.S. industrial properties, mostly logistics warehousing, declined by double-digit percentages in September and October from the same periods in 2021. According to data from the real estate investment platform Real Capital Analytics and services firm Collier's International Group, prices for industrial properties rose by double-digit levels over the identical time periods. Meanwhile, industrial prices in October rose 17 percent year-over-year, while prices in September increased 18 percent according to the data. 
Now you can find more details on these stories and even more happening at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. If you're watching channel don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated you can get the full freightwaves tv experience by heading on over to tv.freightwaves.com after this break we will have a look at our social roundabout and we're talking with thomas Watson. stay tuned The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. Hold on a second, Tony. See that? No scrapes, no scuffs, no damage. Thank you. Because we make sure each pallet is touched as few times as possible and that is handled with care, no matter where it's going. That's the precision you get from a nationwide LTL freight company with over 35 years of industry-leading experience, an entire team that's driven to deliver on time and damage-free. XPO, your freight, first. You think that truck uses Rexo? Don't you mean RxO? I think it's Rexo. There's no E, it's just RxO. Huh. Agree to disagree. Cal, when a company needs to move freight anywhere in the country, RxO is the capacity and technology to handle any size job. Why would I need that? I'm a cow in a field. I don't know. You brought up RxO. I brought up Rexo. Ah, brother. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology. RxO. Find load coverage 70% faster and save time on track and trace with bulk actions within Thai TMS. No matter where your shipments come from, they'll be collected in a single actionable page. Bulk load posting allows your reps the ability to quickly select any number of shipments and post them directly to load boards instantly. Then your reps can easily manage all of their quotes from a single screen. Thai integrates with several real-time tracking tools to make track and trace easy and efficient. But for carriers that won't allow real-time tracking, Ty has a simple feature that allows your reps to mass text drivers all in one click. When drivers receive the text message, they simply click the link, sending tracking data back to Ty TMS and displaying it on the interface for each shipment. Ty sends an email directly to your clients, providing them with the recent tracking update. Easy, right? Book a free demo now to see why Ty TMS should be your TMS partner for the long haul. Today, I picked out a cool video explaining a little bit about the volcano that erupted out in Hawaii last Monday, or this past Monday, rather. Uh, this volcano last erupted on April 15, 1984, and it flowed 16 miles in four days. Let's just take a watch of uh, what's going on out there in Hawaii. Active volcano just erupted for the first time in 38 years. This is Mauna Loa, a giant shield volcano 13,680 feet tall above sea level and 30,080 feet tall from the bottom of the sea, which happens to be taller than Mount Everest. It's erupted a total of 33 times since 1843. The last time it erupted was on April 15th, 1984. Lava flowed almost 16 miles in around four days. Its new eruptions began at 4.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday, November 28th, after a series of earthquakes ranging from magnitude 3 3.2 to 4.0. The eruptions originated at the summit in the Mokuweweo caldera and moved to the northeast rift zone, where three fissures have been feeding several lava flows. These eruptions resulted in lava fountains blasting up between 100 and 200 feet in the air. Lava isn't the only thing to worry about, though, as volcanic gas and ash could be carried downwind. The lava could take weeks or months to reach major populations, but eruptions like these can be very dynamic and ground conditions can change rapidly. Kind of interesting how uh, that volcano is technically taller than Mount Everest due to uh, its size under the ocean floor. Changing it up a bit. Let's take a look at this uh, Twitter post from one TSA spokesperson about a cat. Smells the cat recently uh, rescued from a checked bag at JFK. It spent uh, this week enjoying a Thanksgiving meal out in Brooklyn. I believe it was heading down to Orlando. I think there was a, he, he might have heard about a big mouse out there he wanted to chase. But anyways, speaking of cats, I know we got a cat person in the house ready to uh, be interviewed. Let's go over there and uh, see what's going on. 
That's correct. Thomas Wasson here is a cat dad indeed. <laughs> you got the cat dad clothes on as well. You know, not covered in fur at the moment, so that's, that's good. That's pretty good. That's I, don't, I don't know how you did that. I, I hid it in the dryer, that's why. <laughs> got you. Well, we have Thomas Wasson here, and Thomas, I like this segment. We get to talk about interesting stories and enterprise trucking. It's almost like a story time and Thomas is the one we're all gathering around to hear from. So Thomas, let's jump into it. First thing we have is FMCSA Universal Truck ID. Uh, that's a fun story because it's been going around since 2013. So the CVSTA, the folks who do the annual road check and stuff, they, they put it on. So they told the FMCSA, we need a way to universally ID these trucks back in 13. And 15, the FMCSA says, nah, not enough stuff. I don't want to deal with it right now. Well, you've got companies like PrePass who happen to do that, the PrePass Alliance. And so it's fascinating because in September of this year, they've taken back up the rules. So this is like a decades long drama that we're finally learning about. It's slow moving, by the way. And uh, the, the most humorous aspect is, well, the federal government does want to have a universal ID for way stations and everything else. Basically, a government pre-pass. Well, a lot in trucking is mad because your owner operators are still angry over the 10-year-old ELD mandate. They don't like doing that. And then you also have the folks at pre-pass who have literally built up, you know, 750,000 uh, participating people, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in investment for pre-pass technology. So it's a fascinating situation because, uh, as I noted in the newsletter, you can take it one of two ways. Uh, is the FMCSA finally getting into the 21st century, or are they basically wanting a government version of pre-pass? It sounds very boring, but for truckers and stuff, every time you drive by the station, the little pre-pass, if you're participating, which you hope you are, you don't want to stop at every way station, it gives you a green or a red, and it tells you whether you have to pull in and get inspected. The fun thing about working with Thomas is that we get many answers like this, many conversations that we are just in the middle of at all times. And there's always something interesting he has to say, always a hot take, if you will, as well. And so we're going to get into a couple of hot takes. We're talking about Tesla's semi and the 500 miles that it went. It's, it's impressive. Two things that stick out. One, they did 500 miles. Uh, this is not really a press release. With Tesla, it's like whatever Elon Musk decides to tell you. So he's, as a, he's the equivalent of the person who's throwing out uh, nuggets of information from a park bench, and Twitter just happens to be the pigeons around. So... Uh, 500 miles, 81,000 pounds. Now, to your average person, you're thinking, Thomas, why does that matter? Well, GWR, or gross vehicle weight tonnage on the roadway, is 80,000 pounds. You can only be eight, so you're 1,000 pounds heavier, and you're probably thinking, why is that? Well, things we don't know at the moment is, is the tractor over the around 11,000 to 12,000 pounds because of the batteries and maybe 14 or 15,000 pounds. They're putting bricks under these things. So one question that's not answered. Two, how laden, how heavy was this vehicle when we completed it? Three, where is the location of it? Was it in the Sun Belt? A cool thing I learned riding in the Nikola truck that had batteries is that they have to stay around 72 to 74 degrees. Uh, you know, we're not like retirement home hot, but we're probably like a little bit hotter and we turn the thermostat down. What happens in the cold? What happens at elevation changes? What happens when the fan goes out? So the Tesla Cybertruck, it's fascinating because we finally get a proof of concept. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, carriers and people are paying close attention to this, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions in terms of uh, the nuts and bolts of how this came to be. Now, I think 81,000 pounds and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's a large number. That's cool. But I completely forgot about the fact that we can't be over 80,000 pounds. So what happens there? Infrastructure breaks down. Why be over instead of on? A magical thing called IFTA and other taxes. With Uncle Sam and the government, their infinite wisdom, as well as the states of Kentucky, Oregon, and I think New York for NY Hut, all hate it when you have over 80,000 pounds on their road. Why? Because trucks tear up roads. There is a whole Wall Street Journal article about how residents in Atlanta were angry because truckers were taking back roads and tearing them up. So the weight issue causes degradation on roadways. 81,000 pounds may not seem like much, but in the eyes of Uncle Sam, you're going to have to pay up because asphalt ain't cheap and we're not as good as the Romans. So, you know, obviously there's going to be some changes. So what does this lead to? Does this mean, you know, this is more of a proof of concept right now. FMCSA and the government agencies have taken a, let's see if y'all can pull this off first and then I'm going to come in and find ways to, you know, manage this situation. So will that mean that they may have to pay higher taxes? Are you going to be paying instead of per gallon per charge on the degradation of the roadway? There's a lot of fascinating things that, uh, you know, trucking is closely watching 
interesting because it's not just simply for a large carrier to buy 5,000 Tesla trucks. You also have all of this back end stuff, including infrastructure and maintenance. Do I have my maintenance people trained up? Do I have facilities for it? Will my roadside people manage to handle it? Am I caught up on my taxes because if you don't do that by the way if then then they will find you equivalent you know you're going to file your taxes and your uh with the uh with the government and they'll figure out hey where's your if then from it where's your fuel stuff did you not log how many miles oh you didn't oh guess what well i'm going to log them for you you have to pay up and that's a big one the one that you just mentioned of course out of all the list of things that's coming up the infrastructure aspect i can only imagine how much that will have to get rolled out into okay this proof of concept is successful now we need charging stations all over the country. I already know about just the idea of having a hybrid or a pure electric car, and then I get that range anxiety going in my head. I'm just like thinking, <laughs> how far can I go? Do I just stay around the, the local city? Where can I be right now? And so I can only imagine that aspect going into a freight truck. Exactly. There's a lot. You got folks like ChargePoint and everything that are working on this. But just like that book, Things They Don't Teach You in School, things they don't mention in trucking and ESG initiatives include how are the power companies going to be managing this? Because like you said, uh, luckily for Tennessee, apparently most of our stuff is nuclear. Uh, you know, the Watts Bar folks down there. If you hear any sirens, folks, it's OK. We're, we should be all right. But, uh, you know, having for to give you an idea of how important this will be as we put up, media outlets are picking this up, by the way, Bloomberg and a few others are saying in a more scarier term, uh, truck stops may have the equivalent of a stadium and power drop. Well, no, probably not because of how charging and cycles work, but there is important questions to be asked because like states like California who are wanting to go fully electric, right now their infrastructure can barely handle a hot summer day in LA. Uh, Texas's infrastructure can barely handle a cold day in Houston. So there's a lot of important questions in terms of uh, utilities providers. They want to have this because this is revenue. Uh, instead of a gas station, uh, EPB could be charging me to per you know kilowatt hour or gigawatt hour or whatnot. And so we know that they want this, but we haven't, like you said, in an infrastructure. I've really given it thought. We, the infrastructure bill will finally fix the roads, but are we gonna fix the power lines, the transformers, and everything else? So pay close attention to these developments. Right now, uh, you know, nuclear energy and other ways are a great way to do it, but it's not like we have a build queue of nuclear reactors. I think the last one we opened up was like 10 years in the making. So there's, there's nothing on the schedule yet, but uh, this is gonna be a very fascinating thing. For also folks who wanna get into it, look at Gen 3, Gen 4. There's actually new reactors that use spent fuel that they're making, very small portable ones. So think of it for a second. Now, here's a cool future state. We could theoretically have a, um, a, a gas, a fueling station. Now it's not gas now anymore, maybe electric, a charging station. And it could have a small mobile portable like a Gen 3 or Gen 4 reactor out back. And you just kick it a few times. It won't explode. It's okay. They're safer now. And then that's what's fueling it. So there's a lot of opportunities in this space. But just remember that we're the very early days. This is the equivalent of like with a Tesla truck. Uh, the Wright brothers in Kitty Hawk decided to fly and it looks really great. But it took another 10 or 20 years before we saw the very first viable commercialization of airlines and so we're in this very early stage now so it's super fascinating though and it's great to talk about well thomas while we still have you on i do want to jump around a bit and we're going to talk about the fmcsa rejecting the work rule exemption for livestock haulers Let's get into that. I, I feel sorry for the livestock folks. Um, usually farming and livestock does kind of get this a, a situation where uh, you can get away with not needing the LD. But uh, honestly, the FMCSA said, yeah, you're telling me you don't need this, but I still need to know why you don't need it. So just use the ELD. Uh, you see that a lot with farm, agriculture, livestock, and even some that do like uh, hauling of uh, products like milk and other things. You know, we're at the very early part of the supply chain. Well, what they're doing is they're moving the raw products in into the processing for our snack goods and other CPG. Like uh, like Biden just still talks about, even the CPG supply chain involves a lot of this farm stuff. So uh, it, it's fascinating because, I mean, honestly, if all of trucking has to do it, the farm folks have to. The reason they don't is the whole air mile radius because if they're not driving within a certain like 150 mile air mile radius, there's a lot of exemptions involved. So that's where the argument comes from. I'm not going very far. I'm just working the equivalent of a day. So uh, it, it's fascinating. It's just gonna be more work for them. But I mean, at the same time, once FMC CSA collects the data, they can then go back and say, hey, you were right. Y'all aren't running into cows on the road in the middle of Iowa, so we should be good. So there's still, it's not like they're out of the game. It's just a setback. 
Thomas, I know you already have a show, but this might have to be a regular thing. I love it. Thanks so much for being here. I know you have Load and Rolling, which you can catch on Tuesdays nope. live, going live, doing it live. But right now we're going to take a quick break. But don't worry, we have more Thomas Watson coming up and much more for us now. Stay tuned. When guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we've brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join us in June. <laughs> So, you need to reroute a large shipment from LA to Boston. With XPO, you can make it happen with one call to right here. An XPO team with local connections that will help find a solution. We've spent over 35 years perfecting LTL freight operations to make it easy for our customers to do business with us. Why? Because we're driven to be the best. XPO, your freight. First, what does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. <laughs> This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Hey, Cal, what are you reading? It's Rules of the Road. You gonna get a driver's license? Yeah, I wanna drive for RxO. Cal, you can't drive for RxO. Independent drivers use RxO's technology to connect with nearby freight loads. We're actually a leader in asset light transportation. Why are you always crushing my dreams, Egret? I'm not crushing anything. Do you even have a truck? There you go again, a little yellow beaked dream crusher. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology, RxO. We are back on Fruit Waves now. I'm Sydney Edwards, this is Anthony Smith, and I think that RxO commercial is hilarious. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's one of my favorite ones, and I'm glad it's in the rotation. Although, of course, I'm a bit biased with inflation, inflation, inflation. Inflation, inflation, inflation. <laughs> we have our next guest with us. It's Andrew Lockwood. He's the Senior Director of Sudeth Global Logistics. Andrew, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, and I have to agree. I, I love the inflation, inflation, inflation <laughs> commercial. It's been well played, but it is so true in this, in this uh, environment. For some reason, it's still a thing, and I, I hate that it's still a thing, but what can we do except continue to keep buying and continue? To, but that's a whole other conversation for a whole other story. <laughs> but Andrew, while we have you on, we were talking about marketing within the freight space, and particularly on trucks. Agreed. And, and I realize I'm going maybe a little off the reservation here and talking about marketing and logistics and supply chain in the same sentence. But I want to share with you a few observations uh, from my trip up to Chattanooga last week. So I had the family in the car, eight hours up, eight hours back. Uh, what was interesting and what, I, what my takeaway is, is that we have a vastly underutilized advertising space with both rolling billboards, tractor trailers, and parcel boxes. So let me kind of break it down for you a little bit. On the tractor trailer front, and again, this is not going to fit every fleet, but these th this is prime space to advertise products. And some companies do this well. Think think Doritos, right? There's entire trucks with a Doritos chip bag and the Doritos exploding out of the chip bag. Uh, that's a great example of what could be. And and the reach is actually pretty you know pretty far. Um, one you know one term market you know marketeers are going to use is what is the acquisition cost to you know reach a thousand people. And when you do the breakdown, you're going to, to spend a couple thousand dollars for an upfront design, and perhaps two to three thousand dollars a month to place an ad on a on a tractor trailer. But that uh, that impression cost for 
a thousand people is uh, you're looking at like 65 cents as opposed to a much steeper rate in other advertising mediums. Again, it's not going to be a fit for, for all brands. There's a risk to it as well. Um, if you've got a trucking company that's all over the U.S. and you, and you have certain partnerships with companies, that's prob- that could be a good fit. Um, if you're a local fleet and you don't, you know, really, you, you're trying to build your brand equity, probably not a fit. Uh, but I just I saw that as an observation. The other advertising space, though, that I want to talk about is with parcel boxes. I have a few props uh, here. So I received this in, uh, in, in, you know, from Amazon while back Thursday night football. That makes sense. Uh, they signed a big Prime TV deal, so I, I, you know, I saw that box. I thought it was interesting. A lot of color to it. But last week, Black Friday, I get something from Amazon. Look at this Chevrolet. What does Chevy have to do with Amazon? I had no idea. I thought this was quite interesting because this is probably the last frontier of advertising space. Um, there, there is so much potential here from a co-branding standpoint. Because look, we all are going to use Amazon. Seeing Amazon's logo on a box doesn't do anything for us, but that is prime advertising space that I think is cheap, has a far reach, and there's been studies that have shown it's 4.1 times more effective than other traditional media uh, from an advertising standpoint. You know, I think about all the packages that sit in my mailroom at my apartment that sit there for days, hours, however long, and they're all sitting there and I see every single one of them every time I walk past it. The great opportunity for me to notice something and maybe buy it, see what it is, all the above. And I do agree. It seems like not a lot of people are taking advantage of it. I'm surprised that Chevy did with this Amazon box, truly, because I feel like I, all I see is maybe a colorful logo, like like HelloFresh, for example, has their green box. It says HelloFresh on it. You know what that box is. But anybody else could be marketing on that as well. Well, exactly. And so I ran some quick numbers here. And so if we take 2021, for an example, 21 or let's see, 21.6 billion packages. And let's say we're a large company with a large marketing budget and we want to reach 10% of that. So 216 million parcels, um, you know, and, and let's use a cost of $20 to reach a thousand people, which is much higher. That's a magazine rate really, where if you go to Facebook, you're going to pay a quarter per thousand impressions. Let's Let's hedge high, $20 per thousand parcels. Um, You're looking at $4.3 million, which is chump change. For a company like GM, who spent uh, $2.7 billion last year in marketing and advertising. Now, again, it's it's one medium. It's a parcel box, and I think it's been underutilized because the thought is, well, it's really just going to one person. The mail carrier is going to see it in that one person. But you look at uh, you kind of do the multi- in multiplication effect there. The the reach is really vast. Uh, I was just surprised that Chevy has really been the only one. And in researching and googling this, they're I think they're the only company um, outside of what Amazon has kind of co-branded from a content standpoint. Thursday Night Football and some of the movies that they have put on Amazon Prime to use this. So just uh, quite surprised there. But uh, it, interesting observation from Black Friday. And Andrew, I also have to recognize that well-placed phrase of prime marketing space that you mentioned earlier. I think it was just too good just not to pass up. But when we're looking at this branding opportunity for a lot of, you know, parcel boxes, do we ever get into the realm of, all right, this might become more of a theft risk when we start to see things like maybe electronics advertised on it, maybe the idea of someone's mind's like, hey, there's a new Sony PlayStation in here or Beats headphones or something like that. Yeah, and that's a great, uh, it's actually a great call out because there are a few risks here. If you've got an expensive premium product, right? Let's say we put Coach on the side of the box. There's a thought process there that it's maybe a little more susceptible to risk. The other risk here uh, that, you know, that I was thinking through is kind of the Kanye uh, Adidas thing that we've seen unfold over the past couple of weeks. So what happens when, uh, let's say you're Amazon or Walmart or Target and you sell ad space on your parcels to a company that you're maybe aligned with from a principles and ideals and culture standpoint, but then things go sour really quickly. That Then you have to backpedal and there's some damage control. So that is another risk there is, um, you know, when you're, when you're a parcel provider, a large uh, retailer like that, you've got to really know, you know, do your homework and make sure, do I want to sell this ad space? Because it does affect your brand equity in the marketplace. It, it's no longer just an Amazon parcel with an Amazon logo. Now you're giving that, that branding right to somebody else. 
it, you know, when we look at billboards on the interstate, no one goes after the billboard company based on whatever's on the billboard. You could have a, a political message. You could have, you know, whatever there, but no one's ever going after the billboard company. I think in the parcel realm, that would be very different. And Andrew, as you look at this industry, of course, now we're talking about Amazon, but do you see there's room for others to take part in this kind of advertising space? I, I think so. Walmart and Target are two that come to mind. It, your larger retailers that really don't have much to gain from putting their logo on the side of the box, I think are the ones that are most apt to sell this ad space. It makes a lot of sense, right? Like, what's a Walmart logo going to do for you? But if you're already selling your product through Walmart, it's only upside for Walmart to sell that space. That's additional revenue that maybe offsets some of their marketing costs. And it's great for the company that's selling their product through Walmart.com to advertise on that box. Uh, there's so many different ways this can go. What I also found interesting about the Chevy ad on this box is they put a QR code. So it's not just the traditional advertisement with the trucks and the Chevrolet logo. It's a QR code that then takes you to a website. Now, you've got to do a little work, right? You've got to take your smartphone out and scan it with a camera, and it takes you to the website. But it's a whole different kind of uh, it, you know interaction with a customer, whereas – a magazine ad is just there, right? I mean, it is what it is. You look through the magazine, you're done with the magazine. The parcel box, Sydney, to your point, it sits in your house. Most people are not going to throw it out right away, but it kind of sits around, and you're going to see this advertisement as you walk through your house each day. So it's, I, you know, it, it's kind of a movement back from the virtual realm where we've been so focused on Facebook impressions and Amazon ads to now back to the physical reality uh, where I think there's a ton of potential. It's just so underutilized. Now, Andrew, have you taken your thoughts to the Sudeth marketing team? You know, it's it's an evolving process, right? And so, um, I, you know, I think from a logistics standpoint, it's we talked about retailers. It makes sense for them. Um, for us, right, we, we're not sending out boxes with a Sudeth logo. So, it, you know, from a logistics and 3PL standpoint, it's a little, it's a little bit different. Um, a lot of our customers probably value that brand equity of having their own logo on the box more um, than, you know, a Suttis logo going out to the marketplace because most people aren't going to associate. They're like, who is Suttis? I bought a product from X. They don't care who it's fulfilled from. Just in the same way, if I bought something, let's say, from XPO or JB Hunt, I don't care that it's fulfilled by that company. I just want to know that I get my product. And so I think a lot of those smaller companies from a distribution standpoint want to control their own destiny from a brand equity standpoint. So for us, that probably doesn't make sense. However, for a large retailer, online e-commerce marketplace, I think that shifts, uh, certainly shifts the, uh, uh, the conversation. Andrew, always great having you on. If people want to reach out, get in touch with you, follow more of your content, and how can they do that? LinkedIn is the best way to do it. Uh, send me a message. I'd love to talk about all things logistics and, uh, yeah, in this new realm of sponsorship and marketing and uh, as it, as it uh, interacts and intersects the logistics and supply chain uh, marketplace. Andrew, thank you again for joining us this morning. It'll be interesting to see if folks start taking advantage of this type of marketing. It's something to look, look forward to in 2023. I think there's a lot of potential here. Now we're going to take a look now over to our wall. We have a carrier update with Tony Mulvey and Donnie Gilbert. Welcome into this carrier update. Donnie, going to start here talking about diesel fuel market. I've actually seen retail prices accelerate a little their downward movement i mean we moved down two cents overnight compared to just the one 100 percent increase uh, so I've, I've put a lot of information on the, on this chart i'll try to get this chart last uh in our last session but i didn't want to get that far but you see wholesale or retail here in blue yep and then when of course when you put all this on one it doesn't look quite as well but you see the difference retail or wholesale is in green you see there's a, a lot more aggressive downward fall in wholesale prices than there are in retail prices mm -hmm. and the spread is down here in red of course you still see that climbing uh a dollar 87 that's really for an average way too high yeah stations are not dropping their retail prices as their wholesale prices are come down they're padding it very well yeah i mean we talked about it back in what july august when we were up a dollar 75 dollar 80 that hey there's room to run and you saw it you saw the reaction right they continued to lower those prices and even when rack prices started to move back up and you saw the spread narrow they continued to move down 
Well, now we're even higher than we were, or the spread's wider yeah. than it was back. This could be the highest peak that I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and there, this, I think, was around $1.90. So, uh, yes, there's definitely enough room where they could almost drop their wholesale price a full dollar, and then they'd be at a 90-cent spread or 87-cent 87 spread, yeah. which we've seen that, you know, back here in October. Of course, that drove prices back up, but still. Yeah they could almost drop, drop their price a dollar. And I've seen this on some areas on social media. I've seen fuel stations. Now, most of these are in Texas where some of the fuel's the cheapest, Texas, mm -hmm. Louisiana. And I've seen where stations have ran deals, $3.99 now. Yeah. They actually got it below $4 or four twenty-five. dollars Again, I told you on one street here in Chattanooga, I've seen the differences of up to 35, 40 cents a gallon. Yep. And within a one mile stretch. And that's some of these are following their basic rules, the conglomerate stations that are really big, just keeping their percentage. So as this drops down, this drops down further and they were down to a 464. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and other stations that were probably privately owned or still at 499. Yeah. Go figure. Uh, so they're still trying to pad it. And then, of course, I fill up at 499, drive a half mile on the road, and wish I'd filled up at 464. Yep. And, of course, the next time I know where to go. Yep, yeah, that almost instant buyer's remorse. Yep. All right, let's hop in the next chart here. Uh, we're going to pop in here. <clears throat> we only got a, a, a little bit to talk about this, so we'll probably start back with this as well. But three-year-old truck use prices, Tony. For pre-COVID, I don't want to do this pre-COVID. I want to drop back here, this pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. We were right around that $70,000 mark. Mm -hmm. And of course, the economy got shut down. Uh, it went, it dropped down. And then of course, everything blew up. It's hard to get it's hard to get new trucks. So cares were holding, holding on. And of course, <coughs> now we knew they peaked out here in March and started to fall down. So we're down to 108,000 as an average at the beginning of October. And when we come back, Tony, We'll talk about this a little bit more because this is part of the reason a lot of these smaller guys are going bankrupt. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Donnie, for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you in the second hour. Right now, we'll take a quick break, but we'll be back with more Freightways Now. truck uses Rexo. Don't you mean RXO? I think it's Rexo. There's no E. It's just RXO. Huh. Agree to disagree. Cal, when a company needs to move freight anywhere in the country, RXO is the capacity and technology to handle any size job. Why would I need that? I'm a cow in a field. I don't know. You brought up RXO. I brought up Rexo. Ah, brother. Massive capacity. Cutting edge technology. RXO. TL Freight Crosstalk facility. And we have locations like this all across North America. East Coast, West Coast, even our neighbors to the North and South. At XBO, our network helps us deliver 18 billion pounds of freight every year to 99% of US zip codes and beyond. And now, it's getting even bigger because we're adding 900 new doors to our terminals. XBO, your freight first.
Good morning, welcome back to Freight Waves. Now I'm Christian Thomas here for the Social Roundabout. Now, a volcano has erupted out in Hawaii and it's the first time that it's erupted since April 15th, 1984. Uh, back in 1984, the lava flowed for 16 miles in four days and erupted again Monday. Let's take a look at this video I found on uh, TikTok that kind of explains what's going on out in Hawaii. The world's largest active volcano just erupted for the first time in 38 years. This is Mauna Loa, a giant shield volcano 13,680 feet tall above sea level and 30,080 feet tall from the bottom of the sea, which happens to be taller than Mount Everest. It's erupted a total of 33 times since 1843. The last time it erupted was on April 15th, 1984. Lava flowed almost 16 miles in around four days. Its new eruptions began at 4.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday, November 28th, after a series of earthquakes ranging from from magnitude 3.2 to 4.0. The eruptions originated at the summit in the Mokuweweo caldera and moved to the northeast rift zone, where three fissures have been feeding several lava flows. These eruptions resulted in lava fountains blasting up between 100 and 200 feet in the air. Lava isn't the only thing to worry about, though, as volcanic gas and ash could be carried downwind. The lava could take weeks or months to reach major populations, but eruptions like these can be very dynamic and ground conditions can change rapidly. Now, it's pretty interesting how uh, that volcano is technically taller than Mount Everest due to kind of like an iceberg. There's more to it underwater. Anyways, changing it up a bit, let's take a look at this uh, Twitter that I, or tweet that I found from a TSA spokesperson of Smells the Cat, who was rescued from a checked bag at JFK, spent uh, the weekend enjoying some Thanksgiving dinner up in Brooklyn. And uh, the family was heading down to Orlando. I believe the, the cat overheard something about a mouse out in Orlando he wanted to chase around. Pretty interesting. Uh, I don't know how long a, a cat could stay in a uh, check bag. But anyways, that does it for this social roundabout. I'm going to toss it back over to Sydney and Anthony. I have to say, when I first saw that story, I didn't realize the cat was in a checked bag. That's awful. Yeah, I don't think that's... Procedure. No. <laughs> but what is procedural is getting registered for our next virtual event. <laughs> that is that right. That is coming up. Oh, yes, December 14th. That's, that's right, correct. December 14th. We have our domestic supply chain event, and that's coming up. And of course, there's going to be yeah. great networking opportunities there until our next in person event. There's going to be a few more virtual ones, and this is the next one happening in just a short couple of weeks here. And of course, Sydney, this includes a giveaway. Ooh, it does. Now, our giveaway, it is a sound system. I believe it is a speaker that we have. That's right. It's the Sonos Portable Smart Speaker Set. And I'm a big speaker person. I have one that I've used for years, but I could use a new one. Yeah, yeah, so could I. And it's only a shame that we are not eligible to win this, but you are if you get registered for this upcoming event, so we'll see you there. We'll be right back with more for It Was Now after this short break. Stay tuned. <laughs> we
guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. When you have thousands of trucks delivering billions of pounds of freight, you need the right equipment, the right technology, and the right team. At XPO, we provide tuition-free training at 130 XPO driver schools across the country and the tools drivers need to be at the top of their game, providing rewarding careers for our team members and top-notch service for our customers. While continuing to deliver LTL freight on time and damage-free, XPO, your freight first. What are you reading? It's rules of the road. You gonna get a driver's license? Yeah, I wanna drive for RxO. Cow, you can't drive for RxO. Independent drivers use RxO's technology to connect with nearby freight loads. We're actually a leader in asset light transportation. Why are you always crushing my dreams, Egret? I'm not crushing anything. Do you even have a truck? There you go again. A little yellow beaked dream crusher. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology, RxO. Welcome into this carrier update. In the second hour of Freight Waves now, Donnie, gonna lead, start off where we left off in the last carrier update, looking at used truck prices. We were just talking about it. It's yeah. one of the bigger expenses that carriers so have. Normally, the number one and number two are driver payroll and fuel. Yep. So, but at some point, we've got to look at insurance costs and what did you pay for a truck? Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen a lot of smaller companies on social media here over the last few months. I mean, it's the prime time of the year, and a small company closed their door yesterday. Yep. Four or five, you know, and you see a lot of people want to sell their trucks and sell and get out of it. Nobody's wanting to buy right now. Yep. Why? <clears throat> and this is part of the reason why. Over the last, since March, April, if you buy a truck, it's worth three or four percent every month going down, mm -hmm. it's getting devalued. It's not really worth buying a three-year-old truck right now because you know it's just getting less valuable and less valuable unless you're making a killing with it. Yep. The problem is if you're brand new buying this, you're probably stuck trying to start your business in the spot market, which is the lowest rates of all right now where they were, the highest rates, mm -hmm. now they're the lowest and you're, they're not making it. They're going out of business. Yeah. As you and I were just discussing, probably anybody that probably find this, use the word, finance mm -hmm. a full price truck in the last 18 months. So we're probably looking about since July, we're probably looking at 85 grand plus, probably overpaid because here we stuck around 70, add 20%, 84, $85,000, 20% mm -hmm. premium. And if you bought it from there on up, you paid a very hefty premium for these trucks. Yep and you probably can't afford them right now unless you, number one, put a lot of money down on them, mm -hmm. or you were smart enough to make your money and put that money back to save up to make these payments now. That was the key was, right, and we, and we talked about it during, during this time was, this is the time where you don't necessarily need to go and buy Mama a new house. New car. Yeah, I mean, this is your time because the market's going to flip and it, you need to have kind of that nest egg because, well, we see it now, right? Rates have come down. Fuel prices, so the second largest expense typically, right, are still well elevated. You've 
to say overpay, but you have overpaid for a, a premium, a, a, a pre, pay that premium. So now your revenue's falling, your operating expenses are higher. Those Insurance. margins that were already thin to begin with are even thinner. I mean, you're talking operating ratios of the best run owner ops in that 90 to 100 range in the best of times. It's very rate. easy to turn that over to 100 and start losing money. Yeah, and then uh, their 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 only answer is just sell our truck and get out real fast, as yep. quick as they can. Yep, absolutely. Let's look at the next chart here. Uh, what areas are performing the best? Well, drive in, it's at 3.76%. This is a tough area to make any money in right mm -hmm. now because of that. Reef are doing a little bit better, but it's on the downhill, mm -hmm. but it's still at 6.05. What should you probably do? Unhook those trucks. Flatbed. Yep. Flatbed has taken off here a little bit over the past few days. It's up to 20, almost 21% for rejection yep. rates. Typically, spot market rates follow rejection rates. So here of the three that we measure, flatbed is probably performing the best right now, but that's very small, very niche. These are the main two. We're driving being probably 80% of it. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Donnie, for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll toss it back over to Anthony and Sydney. And Tony and Donnie, we thank you as well. And now we have our next guest of the day. It's Brandon Wiseman. He is the CEO of TruckSafe. And Brandon has been our most patient guest of the day. I know he's been watching the show all morning. Having me. <laughs> Brandon, it's great to have you on, and we're excited to get to chat with you. And we're talking about a big topic that really kind of con concerns entire supply chain. And we're talking about accident testing and the intricacies of accident tech testing within the industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And you did a great job of really breaking this down on TruckSafe YouTube's channel. And can we talk about really what is accident testing and when do you start utilizing that? Yeah, so if you're a regulated trucking company, obviously you're subject to uh, a bunch of different regulations. One of those, uh, one major component of those regulations is drug and alcohol testing. Generally speaking, the drug and alcohol testing rules apply to drivers who are operating vehicles that require a commercial driver's license. So the larger trucks and the trucks that are hauling hazardous materials and the larger buses that are transporting a lot of passengers, those drivers are subject to drug and alcohol testing. And one of the big components of drug and alcohol testing is post accident testing so your driver's involved in an accident in what circumstances do that does that require post accident testing that's kind of what we broke down in our recent video you know generally speaking um, there are three accident types that require post accident testing if you're a CDL driver um, it's going to be any accident involving a fatality if anyone dies um, in connection with that accident then the CDL driver is going to have to be tested uh, and then the other two accident types um, hinge on whether the driver whether the CDL CDL driver received a citation for a moving violation in connection with that accident. And those two accident types are any involving um, personal injury to any person that requires immediate medical attention away from the scene of the accident. So if they get transported to a hospital because of their injuries and the CDL driver was cited for a moving violation, that driver has to be tested. And then the last one is if there's any disabling damage to any of the vehicles that requires it to be towed away from the scene. And again, the driver receives a citation in connection with that accident that requires post-accident testing. So it's important to stay on top of those things for sure. Now, which do you see the most of? I'm going to assume that it is moving violations where there needs to be testing afterwards. Yeah, it's going to be those two latter categories, either the, the injury requiring immediate medical attention away from the scene, or most often it's going to be the, the what seem like relatively minor accidents, but require one or more of the vehicles to be towed away from the scene. Far and away, though, those are the types of accidents that are implicating the post-accident drug and alcohol testing requirements. And Brandon, we're looking at the post-accident testing. Is there a certain time frame that needs to apply to these different types of tests? Yeah, and that's the trick. And that's where I find a lot of motor carriers get themselves in trouble is not understanding or not complying with the time limits. Um, so the regulations are very specific. These types of tests, if they're required, have to be conducted within certain amount of times, a uh, certain amount of time. So for alcohol tests, they have to be conducted within the first eight hours after the accident. And then for drug tests, those have to be conducted within the first 32 hours of the accident. And so what you'll find a lot of times is that uh, either because of, of um, you know, a lack of communication between the motor carrier and its driver, or because the driver is detained at the scene of the accident for a long time, or the driver is transported to a hospital, and then you lose 
connection with the driver. Uh, any any one of those can contribute to you not getting these tests done in time, and uh, and that causes a lot of problems because if you don't get the test done in time, um, then then you can't do the test after the time limits have expired, and then you're looking at at pretty serious violations uh, if the DOT comes in and does an audit. So it's important to get those tests done within those required time frames. Especially when certain drugs leave your system quicker than others. Would it be fair to say that maybe we should have some of those tests on hand so that when the accident is there, they can get that testing done and over with afterwards? Or is there a certain policy or procedure that needs to be followed before those tests are given? Well, first, first of all, my recommendation um, to all motor carriers is that you have a very clear um, checklist of things to do if there's been an accident. We also did a, a video on this recently where we talk, walked through exactly what should be on that type of checklist so that if you find yourself in that situation, obviously, it's a very stressful situation for everyone involved. You don't want to have to be figuring out what are the requirements, uh, you know, right after that accident occurs. So plan ahead, do some planning ahead, get, put a checklist in the trucks in all of your trucks or all of your buses so that your drivers can just you know move through the checklist they're not having to think on the spot uh, and also another important thing is to really um, really open up that line of communications with drivers make it a make it clear to the drivers that they need to remain in constant contact with you with your safety team following an accident so that you don't lose track and, and you're able to determine uh, whether the accident requires post-accident testing and then to your point Sydney the um, uh, having tests on hand usually you know in that situation you're either going to send your driver to a local clinic to to have the test done or there are certainly services out there that offer mobile testing so they will come to the site of the accident and conduct the test so um, you know there's certainly some options there available to you and I definitely see this as such a huge and important part to our industry and do you see this really kind of growing and really significant as we start to see for some time there was like an increase for a brief period of seeming nuclear verdicts really happening. Does this really kind of put the spotlight and importance on testing? Yeah, and then the other thing is the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. So the Clearinghouse is a federal database that was implemented about three years ago. The FMCSA set up this database to consolidate all of the drug and alcohol testing violations for all CDL drivers in the entire country. So what's been interesting is to look at the statistics from that Clearinghouse over the last three years. The, the most recent report from the FMCSA indicated that there are now over 80,000 drivers in the country that are in prohibited status because of a drug or alcohol testing violation. That's just a crazy number, over 80,000. You know, I think the reports out there uh, when it comes to a uh, driver shortage, the driver shortage that we're faced with is, is that we're about 80,000 drivers short of where we need to be to, to meet capacity. But then you just look, here, here's your missing 80,000 drivers. They've tested positive for drugs or alcohol and now are in prohibited status. So it's certainly a, a concerning issue. It's a huge issue. It's one that we really need to get control of in the industry. With the idea of autonomous trucks in mind, I'd be curious to see if, if drug usage on the road would, you know, be higher if that ever comes to fruition. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, for at the start, so a lot of the autonomous trucking companies are starting out with a safety driver in the cab of the truck to be there in case something goes wrong with with the technology. Um, and what what we don't have yet is clarity from the FMCSA about how that works in terms of if that safety driver is involved in an accident and and it, you know is the post accident testing required in that circumstance. So what we really need when it comes to autonomous trucking is some clarity in the regulations. I know the agency is working on it, but it's going to be some time before we start to see how um, how these safety regulations that have historically been all about a, a human driver in the seat will apply in that context. And when we're looking at really drugs being done, of course, we hear about some hard drugs. Um, we hear about, of course, alcohol definitely playing a role in a lot of accidents. What does marijuana really fall into this? I know there's been a yeah. lot of talks around um, CBD really being useful, especially for drivers getting to have restful sleep, but it stays in the system much longer. Are we seeing yeah. any kind of wavering of that? It's a big issue um, uh, and a lot of nuances to it. So if you look at that clearinghouse data, they also re the FMCSA also reports the top drugs that are being found in, in positive drug tests. Marijuana is far and away the most common 
um, uh, drug that is found in a drug test and that leads to disqualification of the driver. The thing to know, every driver, every CDL driver, every motor carrier should know this, is that marijuana, even though it may be legalized in some states for either recreational purposes or medicinal purposes, the DOT, as it stands now, does not care about that. It does not care whether it's legal in your state. If you are a regulated driver uh, and, and you're subject to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, it is unlawful for you to use marijuana marijuana and to operate a commercial motor vehicle. That, that's it. It's a bright line rule. You cannot use marijuana. It's also interesting you brought up CBD because CBD, um, you know, a lot of the manufacturers of the CBD like to market their product as not containing any THC, which is the psychoactive compound of of, um, of marijuana that cause the, causes the high effect. And so they want to market their product as not containing that. Um, the implication being that you shouldn't be able to test positive for marijuana if you're taking that CBD product. But the problem we have in the industry is that there's virtually no regulation of, of the representations made by those manufacturers manufacturers on their packaging. And so what we're finding, uh, and this is a big problem for, for truck drivers, is that a lot of those representations are not accurate. And it turns out that the CBD product actually does contain THC. And so a driver then um, relies on that representation, takes the CBD for, for pain management or whatever they're taking it for. And then they go get tested um, by their motor carrier for drugs, and, and it comes back positive for marijuana. And they're in trouble because of that. Now they're prohibited from operating a commercial motor vehicle and there's nothing they can do about it. That's that's just the, the law of the land for commercial drivers. And so my advice to all commercial drivers and to all of my motor carrier clients is um, marijuana is a no-go for commercial drivers. Uh, it's unlawful regardless of the legality of it, of it in your state. And then number two, CBD in my view right now is too risky for any drivers to be using unless and until we start to get some regulation on the manufacturer, manufacturers of that product uh, with regard to the representations made on their packagings. Brandon, this has been absolutely insightful and amazing having you on. If people want to be able to follow more of your content, reach out. How can they do that? Yeah, go to trucksafe.com or uh, link up with me on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be sure to have you on again. Right now, we're going to take a look at today's top stories. With a full look at headlines for the day, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, FedEx Freight, the nation's largest less than truckload carrier, will begin furloughing an undetermined number of drivers starting on Sunday. Yesterday, FedEx said the voluntary furloughs will run until March 6th, with drivers getting a guaranteed return to work. FedEx Freight is offering drivers a $300 weekly incentive to accept a furlough. The total payments will be made when the driver returns to work. The number of furloughs to be allowed per service center will be disclosed internally through the week. FedEx Freight said it will not publicly release any details about the furlough totals or the centers where they will be requested. The unit has said previously that not all service centers would be asked to furlough drivers. The volume of sales of U.S. industrial properties, mostly logistics warehousing, declined by double-digit percentages in September and October from the same periods in 2021. According to data from real estate investment platform Real Capital Analytics and services firm Collier's International Group, prices for industrial properties rose by double-digit levels over the identical time periods. Meanwhile, industrial prices in October rose 17 percent year-over-year, while prices in September increased 18 percent, according to the data. And a Peterbilt worker fired after he complained about close working quarters during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic settled a case filed by the Labor Department on his behalf for $150,000. Packard, the parent of Peterbilt Motors, avoided a trial and admitted no wrongdoing in the dismissal of Aaron Carey. He had publicly questioned the heavy-duty truck manufacturer's safety procedures to protect workers from COVID-19 infections at its Denton, Texas plant in 2020. The Labor Department claimed Packard violated the Occupational Safety and Health Act in dismissing Kerry. The parties agreed on Monday in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas to dismiss the complaint. 
The House of Representatives voted 290 to 137 yesterday to intervene on a potential rail strike. They also voted 221 to 207 on an additional resolution that would guarantee seven days of paid sick leave for rail workers. All Democratic House members voted yes on this resolution, and three Republicans agreed. Those Republican congressmen who voted for sick leave were Don Bacon, Brian K. Fitzpatrick, and John Katko. Now, the bill will now go to the Senate, where some lawmakers say they demand such legislation guarantees paid sick leave, including Bernie Sanders of Vermont. It is expected that the Senate will pass legislation to prevent a rail strike, but it remains unclear if the Senate will solidify demands for seven days of paid sick leave. It would be the first time since 1991 that Congress intervened on a rail labor dispute. And the European Union's ban on seaborne imports of Russian crude goes into effect this coming Monday. As of today, the G7 and EU price caps meant to complement that ban have still not been finalized. In June, the EU agreed to ban seaborne imports of Russian crude beginning December 5th and imports of Russian refined products beginning February 5th. It also banned EU shipping services, including shipping reinsurance, for all Russian exports to non-EU countries as of those dates. Now, UK protection and indemnity clubs insure over 90% of the world's tankers. UK P&I clubs heavily rely on EU reinsurance. Therefore, the EU sanctions would effectively bar most tankers from Russian export trades. Now, this has alarmed U.S. officials who feared EU sanctions went too far. By cutting off too much Russian volume, they thought oil prices would spike and prices for U.S. consumers would rise. And you can find details on these stories and even more happening at FreightWaves.com and on the FreightWaves app. And if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to tv.freightwaves.com. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more FreightWaves Now. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. So, you need to reroute a large shipment from LA to Boston. With XPO, you can make it happen with one call to right here. An XPO team with local connections that will help find a solution. We've spent over 35 years perfecting LTL freight operations to make it easy for our customers to do business with us. Why? Because we're driven to be the best. XPO, your freight first. That truck uses Rexo. Don't you mean RXO? I think it's Rexo. There's no E. It's just RXO. Huh. Agree to disagree. Cal, when a company needs to move freight anywhere in the country, RXO is the capacity and technology to handle any size job. Why would I need that? I'm a cow in a field. I don't know. You brought up RXO. I brought up Rexo. Ah, brother. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology. RXO. Welcome into this week's On the Spot. I'm Tony Moby, joined by Thomas Watson. Thomas, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. Got a segment earlier. Glad to be on this segment because, I mean, there's a lot going on right now, and rail strikes have been the talk of the town. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what this whole theme of this week's On the Spot is going to be, is the rail strike, obviously, you're seeing 
The odds of that happening are, what, almost slim to none at this point. So especially as Congress is working their way to intervening to, to avoid <laughs> it happening. But I thought, what better way to kind of see what the potential impacts could have been, right? Because in Sonar, we saw what back in September when this initially happened, we kind of saw the impacts of what could have happened because we saw the data that kind of showed what was happening. And we'll bring up a first chart here. It's our uh, outbound, total outbound loaded rail container volumes. And we have it based seasonality. So you can see kind of how holidays impact rail volumes as a whole. I mean, you look right now on the far right, you see the dip down very similar to what we saw in the two previous years. You look back September, you see similar decline and for and so on. What happened in September though, when you think about that initial talks or threats of the rail strike, when this tentative agreement was starting to go through, hey, we're just kind of going to move it down the line as, as the unions were voting on it, you did see a reaction kind of from shippers to pull some volume off the rails, you see a, almost a holiday-like dip immediately following Labor Day. Exactly. And I mean, that's what's so fascinating, because we see the dip for the Labor Day holidays, and we see the second dip is mm -hmm. what is so amazing, because look at our other previous two years worth of data. In terms of container volumes, something's going on when we're seeing that level of movement. So we know for sure that the threat of the rail shutdown and strikes uh, was having a notable impact, at least on carload volumes. Yeah, and I think that's the key but if you think intermodal and truckload, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one shift, but there is, it's, it is this competitor. There is the ability to shift modes as needed. But what was interesting is the truckload market kind of didn't even balk at the idea of this volume coming off the rails and flowing into the truckload market. We'll pull up our next chart and we'll see our outbound tender volume index and there was no movement. And, and I think that's, it's not really a surprise if you think OTVI tracks more of those contracted volumes, right? Things that were intermodal or on the rail, shifting it into a truckload, odds are it was going to be in the spot market and not necessarily contracted freight, right? So I think to not see a reaction in OTVI, not really a surprise. Exactly, I mean, when we see with OTVI, we're still seeing volumes declining across the board. And for truckload, truckload and rail, the, mo the modal means are frenemies, like you yeah. said, because you know we hear about shippers switching from rail to truckload and vice versa with savings. Uh, completely agree though with, from a trucking standpoint, there's so much capacity to soak it up that volumes are still going down. And even in spite of the threat of the entire economy, potentially $2 billion a day grinding to a halt, trucking is like, I got some space. Now, not to the space extent, as some folks have said, you know, ACT Research and FDR, a bunch of experts have also said you need hundreds of thousands of truckloads to do it. But what is so fascinating to watch, like you said, is that truckload, uh, you know, uh, intermodal did a sneeze and a cough, truckload's not even moving at the moment. Yeah, and, and this is one of those things, when you think about it, it's, you should see if, there was this time sensitive freight or something had to get moved, right? You would see some movement one way or another, right? Like you would have seen it flow into more volumes or spot market would have started heating up and it would have pushed rates up. And guess what? It, it didn't really do that just at the threat. And now we're, what, a couple days away. You would have thought to see, okay, maybe we see some impacts. Well, guess what? They're not really showing up. We'll pull up our next chart here and it's our outbound tender rejection index. And there was a little bit of movement, but it was more in line with what we saw in previous months. I mean, we're still in this broader downward movement in rejections, which isn't a surprise when you factor in things like fuel and I mean, just the rates in general coming down, contracted rates more attractive. You see better tender acceptance, but you look here, there's a little bump. I mean, you see it come down after, rejections come down after Labor Day. Not really a surprise. You saw a little bump, but if you look back into August, you saw a similar increase right there in the middle of the month, similar to this. So, I mean, and they stayed under 6%. I think that's the key. It's like, we didn't see rejection rates go from 5% to 10%, indicating, hey, maybe there's stuff flowing into the spot market, spot market activities kind of ramping up. Wasn't necessarily the case back in September. It's not gonna be the case now either. I mean, that's the, 
anything spot market related now is going to be kind of holiday related, right? Getting things more time sensitive to stores to replenish. But these retailers and locations like that, they've had inventory levels that are so high that the time sensitive nature is not there and you're not seeing any real activity in necessarily in the spot market. When you look at rejections at what, 4% or so? I mean, we talked about it earlier, a carrier update that drive-in rejections are sub 4%. Yeah, it's fascinating, great for shippers right now, but like you said, if there was gonna be a meaningful impact, we would have seen rejection rates at least not continue downward. The, yeah. the market is so you know against trucking right now in terms of how the business cycle has changed that even the threats of a rail strike are not enough to consistently. Now, if, if you want me as a trucking expert to say, hey, this is having an impact on trucking, we would have seen that rejection rate, we would have seen spot rates, we would have seen some form of legs and not this continuous downward trend that we're still seeing because the broader market, in spite of rail's best efforts to mess it up, is still moving in the direction of a shipper's market. Yeah, for sure. And we'll bring up the rates just to just to show it too. I mean, we have the NTI. You see it uh, kind of in that same time frame, right? Middle of September. That's actually when rates were moving down in September, right? You saw them increase kind of into the Labor Day holiday weekend. And even the week after, there was a little sustained momentum. But after that, right as this threat of, as things were moving off, off the rails, as we saw in that first chart, you didn't see anything happen in the national or in the NTI, and it actually deteriorated some more into the back half of the month. And I think we're at this point, we've, we've talked about it and we've looked at it, that NTI forecast, right? It's directionally right, I mean, it's been right almost the entire time following this, this trend line lower, and in December, it's expected to continue to decline. And, and when you start to think about now that this threat of the rail strikes, I don't wanna say it's completely over and out of the woods, but it seems like that's the case. I mean, just give, we've got about a minute, give kind of your idea of what, I mean, are the impacts to trucking going to be anything at all? I mean, what what is the next, say, month look like? I mean, impacts to trucking, small carriers, owner operators, more of the same, business as usual. You're not really exposed as much to intermodal. Large trucking carriers, J.B. Hunt, Schneider, Knight, Swift, even hub group and brokers. If you have access to the rails and you're dealing with service levels, uh, container turn times, uh, even with J.B. Hunt's business is a huge part of intermodal. So this growth story for larger carriers, I'm paying close attention to this if I have a heavy intermodal exposure because that's directly impacting my earnings and stuff. So you're going to pay attention to that. But for the rest of trucking, I would not expect a situation where we're going to see, uh, you know, very n notable movement because they're still busy doing your regular, you know, replenishment cycles and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for joining me on this week's On the Spot. Right now, we'll take a quick break, but we'll be back with more Freight Waves Now. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. Hold on a second, Tony. See that? No scrapes, no scuffs, no damage. Thank you. Because we make sure each pallet is touched as few times as possible and that is handled with care, no matter where it's going. That's the precision you get from a nationwide LTL freight company with over 35 years of industry-leading experience, an entire team that's driven to deliver on time and damage-free. XPO, your freight, first. What are you doing up there, Bert? The RxO folks want us to demo their technology. That's smart. Yeah, not really. My beak doesn't work so well on this tablet. Well, they're paying us now, so... I know, here goes. Our customer's freight has seamlessly moved anywhere in North America using RxO's digital platform to access over a million and a half trucks. That sounded good. I think I broke my beak. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology, RxO. Find load coverage 70% faster and save time on track and trace with bulk actions within Thai TMS. No matter where your shipments come from, they'll be collected in a single actionable page. Bulk load posting allows your reps the ability to quickly select any number of shipments and post them directly to load boards instantly. Then your reps can easily manage all of their quotes from a single screen. 
Ty integrates with several real-time tracking tools to make track and trace easy and efficient. But for carriers that won't allow real-time tracking, Ty has a simple feature that allows your reps to mass text drivers all in one click. When drivers receive the text message, they simply click the link, sending tracking data back to Ty TMS and displaying it on the interface for each shipment. Ty sends an email directly to your clients, providing them with the recent tracking update. Easy, right? Book a free demo now to see why Thai TMS should be your TMS partner for the long haul. Welcome into our final carrier update of the morning. Donnie, you're going to get into our lanes of the day. Really starting here, here in the southeast, right, out of Atlanta, I mean, trying to find rates that are relatively strong compared to market. I mean, here's one, Atlanta yeah, so to we, Wilmington. We saw some upticks in the Wilmington market. We were just kind of checking out. So I figured, let's put up here on the lanes today. Now, where would you deliver into Wilmington from? Well, a lot of the freight probably coming out of the central location of Atlanta, mm -hmm. warehousing, delivering out to the southeast. So I chose Atlanta to Wilmington. And as you can see here, I pulled my NTI up here. It's at $2.67 on the on the uh, on an uptick right now because of the end of the month. But Atlanta to Wilmington is still a pretty good rate at 319. Now it's a shorter run. It's 417 miles. So you can't go Atlanta to Wilmington back to Atlanta in one day, but you can at least get picked up and on the way home. But you're still pulling in about uh, 319 for a rate per mile. But the confidence score is low. There's a lot of volatility in this rate. So maybe same day pickup, maybe you catch the guy at the right time, you can pull as high as 370. Yeah. <clears throat> but you also could get put down and pushed down to $2.75 a mile as well. Yeah. Or 278. So um, could be a, a pretty good steady lane here. If we hit the little double arrows and reverse this back, which we're to go back to Atlanta. Well, it's still 307 for an average. So you can pull the same property at over $3 a mile, anywhere from 268 to 347 on the spread for this lane. Again, well above our NTI, but it is a little bit shorter of a run around that 400 mile mark. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it. I mean, it's right around that $3.10. And we've been looking for those lanes that are over $3 a mile average. And th this is one that, hey, if you can do it, they are still there and this is, this is where using something like Market Dashboard and, and Sonar as a whole can really yeah. set you and up for success. Yeah, and we're breaking, and this is where it's tough, we're breaking $3 a mile at over 400 miles. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we get around that 250 mark, and we'll see when it's coming up. We could be around that. Next, uh, next chart here on the next lane, Columbus, Ohio to Erie, PA. We saw some movement around Erie, PA. Again, it's only 240 miles, but yet we're getting a $4 a mile going from going into the Northeast. Yep. So that's a really good rate here. It's been kind of steady over the last about month. It bumped up a little bit, but it's been around that little that $4 mark for over 30 days, which is well above our NTI. Uh, it currently running 390 to, 390 to 433. So you got some variance in that rate mm -hmm. as well. Now coming back out of the Northeast, going back to Columbus, Ohio, which is one of the hot spots, we're still at 359. Yeah. So again, this is a load that you could probably hopefully get one full turn in a day. Yeah. You'd obviously need for that uh, shipper receiver in Erie to be a drop and hook on both ends. Run up there, drop and hook for delivery, drop and hook for pickup and come back. And you could turn this every day one full time. Yeah, and obviously at what, over $4 on one end and 360, I mean, you're talking 375, 380 there for an average. Pretty, pretty good run. Pretty, pretty healthy run there. So, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again tomorrow. Right now, we'll toss it over to Bill Priestley. Welcome into the roundtable. Bill Priestley here with you. Zach Strickland, Anthony Smith. We're going to have our own little mini version of Freedonomics, I think, here for the next uh, 11 minutes or so. Peak season. It has come, maybe. I feel like we're in a situation where uh, Santa Claus didn't come down the Christmas tree at this point. Uh, didn't come down the chimney uh, at this point in time. But uh, we'll delve and see what what is going on and is this unprecedented how are we going to get through it and more importantly what's going to happen in 2023 and kind of where we're going here so let me i know we've got a lot of charts to get through here from both of you um but let me first ask us as far as the lines that you have seen on your respective charts are you surprised at where we are in terms of where they are at this point in time 
Uh, no, no, I'm not surprised at all. If we want to pull up one of those, the NTI, uh, the NTI, the National Trucking Index, Truckload Index, if you will here, the white line is the one to focus on. That is the current year. Uh, if you look back over the previous three years, 2019 is the one that shows a little bit of a bump in it. And that's the year that we were soft, uh, yeah. ironically. Um, and the previous two years, we really didn't see a big jump. So right now, no, I'm not surprised at all. And of course, we've seen demand eroding significantly over the last several months. Um, there's a lot of excess space left in the uh, in the market. So truckload capacity, still pretty prevalent. I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of direct to spot market activity with heightened service requirements. Okay, all right. Anthony, what, what have you been, when you look at your lines, what you've seen, what are you, are you surprised by what you've seen leading into Q4 and, and Q1 next year? I'm not too surprised at all. This is really kind of lining up with a lot of our expectations that we put out um, at the beginning of the year. The only thing that would be a little bit more surprising to me is that some of the charts aren't showing worse signals at the moment, um, but they are very much concerning. So, for example, one of the big things that a lot of folks are really kind of being able to hang their hat on about the strength in the relative economy or the relative strength in the economy, of course, is the job openings number. And I think we have that chart up here now. And when we look at the job openings, it's, of course, hovered over 10 million. A lot of folks are pointing at this as just a sign of strength in the consumer market and of course this is a great thing you want people to have options that optionality of course is very much a thing we talk about you know different indices here at freight waves and it's no different when we talk about the consumers but um, the big thing around these options as you see it really kind of ticked up throughout the beginning part of 2022 is that the hiring has definitely not kept kept up with that and that takes some wind out of it and I think we have a chart for the hiring as well and so even though we do see that there are a substantial amount of openings, hirings have really started to slow down throughout the year as well. Zach, when you look at this, uh, kind of where we are right now, what are we experiencing? And second question, are we unfamiliar with this situation in terms of where we are now in December, moving into Q1 of a, of a new year? Yeah, I, I don't think we're necessarily unfamiliar with it. Uh, December is actually the softest month of the year mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in terms of overall demand because we lose a week. A lot of the activity, the experience of chaos, the tightening is really just that sense of urgency that a lot of ships have. Uh, so if we pull up the outbound tender rejection index right now, this is a measure of the rate that carriers are rejecting their contracted tenders from shippers. And you can see that white line, which is the current year, below the previous four years, all four years. So we're seeing the highest levels of contract compliance uh, with the carriers right now than we've ever seen this time of year. So the contract market, which is a little different than the spot market, which I showed you earlier, that's right. the spot rate index. So that's a lot, that's a little bit of a different mix. This is pure contract. So it has everything going on in it. These large shippers, these large carriers, and the rejection rate is down close to 4% and it yeah. barely moved around Thanksgiving. Now mm -hmm. that is the nuance in this year. You see every single other year before this one, uh, the tender rejection index did start increasing around Thanksgiving to some level, uh, but this year it's it's a non-event on the contract freight market. Why does that get your Why does that get your attention? Because it's it means that carriers are simply accepting as much all the loads that they're yeah. getting as much as they can. This is a signal that that spot market rate that we saw you know have a little bit of a bump. That's why I think that there's a lot of direct to spot market activity there, uh, a little bit of expedited uh, flavor in some of these loads uh, that they're just not able to tender through the contract process. Yeah. So overall capacity capacity extremely available. Gotcha. Anthony, are, are we in, I know we're not in unfamiliar territory because we kind of seen this before, but maybe is this a different flavor than what we're used to in the past? I think it's definitely familiar territory, especially when you look at the savings rate. This is mm -hmm. very reminiscent of 2008 because the savings rate is now down to the levels that we haven't seen since 2008. And that's a concerning thing. So when we hear these stories of, of course, Black Friday having stellar results and consumer strength really pushing forward, I don't see this as good news or sign for optimism. I see this as concerning news when you see even if disposable income isn't just falling, you know, you know, into the tank here, we're seeing that the savings rate isn't really quite where it needs to be in order to really kind of hold or sustain consumers in a really kind of favorable way if there is a sudden shakeup in the economy. Yeah. Let me stay with you. And then as you look from, say, December now into Q1 2023, uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot of going to be a lot of relief anytime soon. How do you forecast the next three to six months? I think over the next few months, we're going to see, continue to see more uh, layoffs happen throughout the industry. Um, 
Um, the big thing here that we're looking at, of course, is some of the layoffs are really hitting some of the big tech firms. We're looking at large retailers, of course, you hear them like um, Amazon, mm -hmm. some of the tech firms, Meta, things like that. This is really hitting a lot of folks hard, and so these are going to be some of the higher income earners that are going to have to really struggle to find those roles that we're going to continue to match those same um, payments. And so the other big thing is that as the pendulum shifts here in the, in the labor market, you won't be able to really negotiate for those same uh, conditions that you had throughout the pandemic. So being able to work remote or a hybrid schedules was really a big thing that a lot of folks are able to push for. I don't see this as really being a talking point or starter for a lot of folks as saying, hey, you know what? We are hiring and mm -hmm. we're offering this job and you don't have many other options. I know technically it says you do, but really no one's really hiring right now. So I see that job openings number almost as a lagging indicator. And I see that um, there are a lot of folks that are going to be potentially exposed with these low savings rate and this continued expending, especially as you continue to see credit card utilization so high. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a chart about that. We'll, we'll get that to that in just a second. Uh, Zach, Q1 2023, as we go into the new year, um, you, you brought up the contract rate uh, being uh, the projection rate being so low is that going to rebound quickly or is it just going to stay down there yeah I think it's it's probably going to stay down there for at least through Q1 uh, I don't see any reason to expect demand to come back I mean Anthony just point out consumer conditions are mm -hmm. still deteriorating uh, they haven't fully recognized exactly what you know the bottom is just yet the freight market however is experiencing a relatively you know low end uh, experience it's been experiencing you know deteriorating conditions since March of this year so uh, we still have to fully flush out this economic conditions before we go through the period where we say, okay, we're at a bottom for the freight market. I think I have one more chart here uh, to kind of illustrate this, the OTVI MTH. So this is the tender volume index. And it's a pure demand side indicator. So it is an index of the total tenders being submitted from shipper to carrier. So how much freight do they need to move all at once? And if you look there at the very end, we just had the sharpest month over month decline that we've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, since last year, of course, uh, we had this, you see those dips, each one of those dips, that's December every year. Even during the pandemic, the softest month of the year was December, except 2020. I think January was a little bit more active, but every single year I have a call out there for every single December and it's because we lose a week of activity in the month of December and also if you look at it on a daily basis shippers start winding things down the only stuff that moves in December is that hot commodity freight that has to move with a sense of urgency and then in January it doesn't get a lot better so throughout the winter months we tend to see people really ramp down their shipping processes so through Q1 for sure we're on the floor and then maybe there's a chance that there's some level of of a dynamic shift as capacity is expected to really start consolidating. Mm -hmm. uh, these small carriers are supposed to get gobbled up. Knight Swift talked about that's one of their big key strategies for 2023 is to kind of absorb some of these smaller fleets that can't operate in this environment. Yeah, we're talking about growth through acquisition as mm -hmm. opposed to through, through uh, your own means. Um, Anthony, we talked, uh, you mentioned a little bit about consumer credit. We've got uh, another chart here that kind of is worrisome uh, for us when you see a line that goes up this this quickly, this fast in terms of how people are using their credit and what does this mean for the economy here in 2023? Definitely. So big thing that we've been looking at, of course, is the potential of people or consumers in, in the U.S. overextending themselves and making them, getting themselves in a position that they would be exposed to really being in a poor financial situation. Um, we look at the job openings number and what consumers have been able to do. Being able to job hop is the fastest way to get a pay raise. Not saying anyone needs to leave their jobs or anything like that, <laughs> especially anyone here at Freight Woods, but I am saying that that is the primary way to get a higher pay bump, and that's been a way that a lot of folks have been able to really have that confidence in spending. As we continue to see this credit card utilization rate increase, it's not quite at the same pace as it would have been if there was no pandemic, but it's getting into concerning territory. And on top of that, there's this big black hole that no one really quite knows what it is that's called buy now, pay later, that a lot of folks are also utilizing, unfortunately. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to watch. As we have about a minute left here, uh, guys, so first off for you, Zach, you're talking about the spot rate mm -hmm. bottoming, or at least Joe, Joe Antishak, Kevin Hill have all talked about when is this spot rate going to finally hit a floor and when possibly could it come? They're saying three to six months. Are you buying the over the under or are you pretty much right there? 
I, I think historically speaking, January is just going to be awful. Um, okay. You know, there, there's all these conditions are coming together. We're lining up. We just had a double up wave hit us where it inflated the spot rate. I think we're going to hit that double bottom here in January, February when freight vo volumes tend to be low anyway. And we're coming already out of we're in a transitory cycle coming out of a super overheated environment. Yeah. Anthony, what's the economic indicator that's, that's going to show you that, hey, maybe we're starting to perhaps climb out of this a little bit? I think one of the big ones, of course, is going to be around uh, consumer conditions. So if you look at uh, initial jobs claims, mm -hmm. um, we haven't seen a substantial spike in that one. But if we do see a substantial spike and easing in that would be one of the ones I'm saying, OK, you know what? Consumers are not filing for unemployment as as much as they were. But not anytime soon, probably. Uh, I mean, I don't think we've seen the worst of it just yet, so okay. I think we have some time. All right. Well, that's going to be an interesting scenario to watch over the course of the next three to six months. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll take a short break, and we'll continue with Freightways now after this. When guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously, which is why we've brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. June. You need to reroute a large shipment from LA to Boston. With XPO, you can make it happen with one call to right here, an XPO team with local connections that will help find a solution. We've spent over 35 years perfecting LTL freight operations to make it easy for our customers to do business with us. Why? Because we're driven to be the best. XPO, your freight. First, what does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Can Ark sell good truckloads of grass to Pittsburgh every month? Who do you know in Pittsburgh? Lots of cousins. Always complaining about the grass here. The grass is bad in Pittsburgh. Right? It's bitter, like a cruciferous vegetable. Well, with RxO, you can access over a million and a half trucks, any mode of transportation, even flatbeds. Just log in. There's a log right there. You know what cruciferous means, but not log in? I'm a complicated creature. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology, RxO. We are back on Freight Waves now, and I'm Sydney Edwards with a last look at our headlines for the day. Now, a Peterbilt worker fired after he complained about close working quarters during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic has settled a case filed by the Labor Department on his behalf for $150,000. Now, Pat Carr, the parent of Peterbilt Motors, avoided a trial and admitted no wrongdoing in the dismissal of Aaron Carey. He had publicly questioned the heavy-duty truck manufacturer's safety procedures to protect workers from COVID-19 infections at its Denton, Texas plant in 2019. Excuse me. 2020. Now, the Labor Department claimed PACAR violated the Occupational Safety and Health Act in dismissing Kerry. The parties agreed on Monday in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Texas to dismiss the complaint. 
And the House of Representatives voted 290 to 137 yesterday to intervene on a potential rail strike. They also voted in favor 221 to 207 on an additional resolution that would guarantee seven days of paid sick leave for rail workers. All Democratic House members voted yes on this resolution, and three Republicans agreed. Now, those Republican congressmen who voted for sick leave were Don Bacon, Brian K. Fitzpatrick, and John Katko. The bill will now go to the Senate, where some lawmakers say they demand such legislation guarantees paid sick leave, including Bernie Sanders of Vermont. It is, is, it is expected, excuse me, that the Senate will now pass legislation to prevent a rail strike, but it remains unclear if the Senate will solidify demands for seven days of paid sick leave. It would be the first time since 1991 that Congress intervened on a rail labor dispute. And the European Union's ban on seaborne imports of Russian crude goes into effect this coming Monday. As of today, the G7 and EU price caps meant to complement that ban have still not been finalized. In June, the EU agreed to ban seaborne imports of Russian crude beginning December 5th and imports of Russian refined products beginning February 5th. It also banned EU shipping services, including shipping reinsurance, for all Russian exports to non-EU countries as of those dates. UK Protection and Identity Clubs insure over 90% of the world's tankers. UK P&I clubs heavily rely on EU reinsurance. Therefore, the EU, EU sanctions would effectively bar most tankers from Russian export trades. This has alarmed U.S. officials who feared EU sanctions went too far. By cutting off too much Russian volume, they thought oil prices would spike and prices for U.S. consumers would rise. Now you can find details on those stories and even more happening at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, whether it's on demand or live, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll hand this one over now to Anthony Smith for the rest of the show. Awesome, Cindy. Thank you so much for those headlines. And thank you all so much for tuning in. That's going to do it for the show, but that doesn't do it for this Freight coverage or Freight Waves TV. We have plenty more content coming up. And of course, we have one of the best shows we have at Freight Waves Freight Anonymous with my, Zach Strickland and myself coming up in just about an hour. We'll see you there.